Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening, Professor. <laughs> Professor Ayorinde, welcoming you to another session of organic chemistry. Okay, in today's session, we are going to uh, finish our discussion on chapter two, which we started uh, last uh, Thursday. But before we get the session started, just a couple of announcements. The uh, our own work assignment is due for this week is due on Sunday, September 15 at 11 p.m. That's our own work assignment due for chapter two is due on Sunday, September 15 at 11 p.m. And also, those of you who might find it very difficult to download some of the uh, the uh, webcasts that are placed in our uh, post in uh, Blackboard, uh, if you bring me your flight drive uh, to my office, I will uh, download the, the files for you. Okay, once I download the files for you, then you don't need the internet to play them. Okay, I know you guys want us to go over the quiz question that you guys have just taken. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, uh, Makiba, can you read this for us? Okay, thank you. Okay, what this question is asking you to do here to uh, calculate the formal charges for the labeled at uh, atoms in this molecule and in this molecule. Essentially, what we want to test here is your knowledge of the octet rule and also, of course, the, your knowledge of uh, valence. <coughs> okay, let's do the first, uh, the first one. A. What would be the formal charge on oxygen, this oxygen here? Uh, okay, yes. Uh, Shanti? Negative one, very good. So this is negative one. How did you get negative one? Hmm. Okay, let me repeat that. what you just said. Let me know whether that, that is correct. I uh, would say the valence of the uh, the atom in the free state, okay, and in other words, the number of electrons in the valence uh, shell, okay. We so saw valence. Okay, let me go back here. So we say formal charge equals to valence of atom in is free state okay you may also use the group number for that atom uh, for that purpose okay you could also use the group number in the periodic table okay minus the number of electrons that actually belong to the that atom uh, in the given molecule, right? In the valence shell of that atom in the given molecule. Is that correct? Okay. So in this in this case, therefore, if you take a look at oxygen, oxygen is in uh, group uh, group six, or if you want to look at the current uh, nomenclature for grouping, you say group uh, 16, one six. So in this case, in that case, you take the second digit, which is six. Okay, so the valence uh, oxygen has six valence electrons, so therefore you say six. Okay, how many electrons actually belong to oxygen in this valence shell of this particular molecule? Seven, minus seven. So and that gives you minus one, and that is how you go minus one. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, how about uh, B? Oh, by the way, let me finish this here. Number 
of I electrons that actually belong to the atom in the valence shell, okay? Of the molecule. Okay, very good. Okay, but uh, B, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Plus one. Say that again. Plus one, oh, plus one. Okay, you so said this is plus one. How did you get plus one? Uh, okay, five. That is five for the valence electrons minus minus four. Very good. And that is how you get plus one. Very good. About C. Yes. Kiara, Kiara, okay. Zero? Okay, how did you get zero? Okay, the valence of carbon is four, and then you have four electrons actually belonging to it in that valence uh, shell of the, uh, of the molecule. Okay, so four minus four equals to zero. Very good. Okay, is there any question on that? So you find that, that if you have to determine the uh, formal chart of a particular atom in a given molecule, it's fairly simple. Just use this formula here. Okay, about the next one, this right here. Uh, let us start with A. Yes. What is it? Say that again. Oh, the same? What is what did you say? No zero. Oh, zero. Okay, very good. So how did you get zero? Four minus four. Yes. Okay, very good. Very good. How about B nitrogen. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, right. Please? Yeah, I thought you raised your hand. Five point four. Okay, so this here is five. Number of valence electron is five in its free state, and then it does have only four electrons now. So that is plus one. So this is plus one right here. Okay, about uh, C. Okay, Tara. Negative one. Okay, and that is you got that by six minus. Seven, very good. Okay, so we got number one. <coughs> Go to the next one. <coughs> okay, let us see. Amit, can you go ahead and read this for us? Adrenaline molecule below indicates the hybridization for all the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms. Just point an arrow to each atom and then indicate the hybridization. Okay, thank you. So in this molecule here, which is uh, adrenaline, uh, by the way, adrenaline, that is the uh, same adrenaline, adrenaline that gives you the, uh, the boost, you know, the, uh, the rush when you really, when you are in danger and you need to, <laughs> and you need to, to take off, so it gives you that extra energy. So uh, it's also used as an uh, asthma, asthmatic drug, okay? Okay, so now the, in, the, uh, in the adrenaline molecule below, indicate the hybridization for all the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms, and then also give you a hint, just uh, point an arrow to each atom, and then indicate the hybridization. Okay, so let us start with, now what this question is testing here, also, also testing your knowledge of, uh, of the octet rule. And also testing your knowledge of valence. Okay, so in this case, you need to, 
indicate all of the uh, non-bonding pairs of electrons for those atoms that do require non-bonding pairs of electrons before you complete this question. So let us start with oxygen. Uh, do, we, is this, do we have any non-bonding electrons here, Ashanti? Uh, two pairs? Yeah, two pairs. Okay, very good. Okay, any other uh, atom with no bond, Kiara? To do what? Always assume that they are the same? Oh, 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 no, no, no. If we give you a molecule, unless we tell you that this is just a, a structural frame, or we tell you that this is just a model, then you have to assume that is a real molecule. In that case, you have to obey all of the octet and all of the valence rule. Okay. So in this particular instance here, how did you come out with two uh, two pairs of non-bonding electrons? You know? How did you? Did, okay, because of the octet rule. Why did you come out with two pairs? I can't hear you. Okay. Okay, so you don't need an octet of electron. Let me draw this molecule out. Okay, so if we take a look at this molecule here, uh, go, going by the octet rule, you know that this molecule only has four valence electrons surrounding it at this point, in, the, in this molecule, right, this atom right here. So therefore, you need four more electrons, and that's why you came out with uh, two uh, pairs of non-bonded electrons, okay? And that is, about this oxygen here, how many pairs does it uh, require uh, non-bonding pairs of electrons? Two. Two? Very good. How about this? Same. The same? Yeah. For the same reason? Yeah. How about any other atom? Nitrogen. nitrogen. Okay, well, how many do you need for nitrogen? One. Very good. Okay, so now that we've done that, now, what would be the hybridization of this oxygen here? This oxygen here. What is it? SP3. SP3, very good. How about this carbon? SP3. Why do you say this? that is correct? Why, why is it SP3? Because it's bonded to four atoms. There is hydrogen here. We jo we are not showing it, right? Okay. About nitrogen. Sp3. About this carbon here. Sp3 for the same reason, right? Bonded to four atoms. In the case of oxygen, we assume that the no, each pair of, of non-bonded electrons will be an atom. That is why we say this is sp3. Everybody's oxygen. sp3. Oxygen also. sp3. Everybody's carbon here. sp2. Why SP2? Because it's only bonded to three other atoms, because there is hydrogen here, carbon here, and hydrogen here, right? How about this carbon? This carbon here. 
SP2, very good. Hey, by this carbon. SP2. This carbon here. SP2. This carbon right here. SP2, very good. Okay, I think you guys uh, got your for, uh, formal charges and hybridization uh, down to a science, so I don't have any problem <coughs> with you understanding those concepts. Very good. Okay, any question on this? Okay, let us see here. Uh, Hutchinson, go ahead and read this first. For each of the molecules below, use arrows to show the direction of bond polarity for those bonds that are polar, and then indicate which of the molecules will have dipole moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what this question is asking us to do here is say, for each of the molecules below, use arrows to show the direction of bond polarity for those bonds that are polar. Okay? In other words, each one of these bonds, you got to show the direction of bond polarity, all of this here. Okay, if you consider them to be polar. And then he says, and then indi indicate which of the molecules will have dipole moment. Okay? Let us call this, uh, let us call this A, let us call this B, let us call this C. Okay. <coughs> okay, let, let's take a look at A. Is, do you have any polar uh, covalent bond in this molecule? Yes. Which one? Between the oxygen and carbon. Very good. And the direction of polarity? Towards oxygen. Very good. And you show that by this. And the same thing between this oxygen and carbon? Yes. Okay, that is also a polar covalent bond. And the direction of polarity would be towards the oxygen. Now, is molecule A, is it a polar, is, does it have a dipole moment? Will they have a dipole moment? No. no. Because this, both, both of these dipole cancel out. So therefore, the dipole moment here will be zero. Yes, Kara. Is it the direction of polarity towards O H you said? No, 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 no. The oxygen is more electronegative. It is pulling the electron to itself. See this this arrow here is showing you this is the direction uh, uh, to which we are pulling the electron. In other words, this oxygen is more polar than I mean is is more electronegative than this carbon. Therefore, it is pulling the electron cloud to itself. Right. So I'm saying, like, I, didn't, I didn't think about the C at all. I'm talking about the O and the A. So I'm saying O and H was the only two that missed all the arrow for. Wouldn't the arrow be pointing? Well, see me about what you, what you did. Okay, later. Okay. Okay, uh, any other question on this? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, about molecule B. Uh, any polar covalent bond here, and what would be the direction of polarity if there is between carbon and oxygen? Okay, and the direction towards oxygen because the oxygen has a greater electronegativity than the carbon atom. So we should show this arrow to show the direction of polarity. Now, will this molecule have a dipole moment? Yes, yes it has a net. Uh, uh, therefore, so therefore, we will say this here, the polarity will be greater than zero. Okay, if you just say that yes, if you say yes, it will, that, that is fine. Okay, and the direction of polarity will be this direction here. That will be the direction of that for a moment. <coughs> okay, by molecule C, molecule C, any uh, polar covalent bond? And what would be the direction of polarity? Oxygen? 
Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. Say so, towards oxygen. Right? Right? Okay. Everybody here? Yeah, same thing. Same thing. Okay, and what will be the direction of the uh, dipole moment? The overall direction? To the right. To the right, exactly. So the right here. Okay? Okay, very good. Okay, so yes. Yes. And then indicate which of the models who will have. Oh, oh, oh just wrote the, okay, 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 that's fine. So this would be that pole moment would be greater than zero. Okay, is that my phone? Okay, now let's. I think we finish all the problems. So now let us go to our today's uh, lecture. Okay, today we are going to finish up on chapter 2. Uh, if you recall, when we left on Thursday, uh, we discussed electronegativity, polar covalent bonds. We also di- discussed dipole moments. And finally, we discussed our uh, former charges. So today we are going to finish up with this chapter uh, with our discussion of resonance. And a discussion of acid-base reactions as they relate to organic molecules. Okay. So now we want to discuss resonance. Now resonance is a very important concept uh, to the organic chemist. But before I give you a definition of resonance, I do want to go over a few background information. Let us take a look at this molecule here. What I want to do here is to find a way to relate uh, some of the things that we did in chapters 1 and 2 uh, to this uh, particular concept of resonance. This molecule is called ethylene. As I told you before, this molecule is used to uh, make those uh, plastic uh, materials that you use when you go to the grocery stores the polyethylene bags, that is the precursor to the polyethylene uh, plastic. Now, if you take a look at this molecule here, recall that we said this is a sigma bond. We also said this is also a sigma bond. And this here is also a sigma bond. And this is a sigma bond. And one of these double bonds here is a sigma bond and the other one will be a pi bond. <coughs> if you recall the sigma bond is what we call a head to head overlap. of hybrid orbitals. Or head to head overlap of bonding orbitals. And the pi bond, on the other hand, It's a side-to-side overlap (laughs) 
of those electrons in the p orbitals, of electrons in the p orbitals, of electrons in p orbitals. So we keep that in mind, very important. Now, let us now draw an orbital picture of this molecule that we call ethylene. Okay, if we want to draw an orbital picture of that molecule, of course we have an sp3 orbital there, another sp3 orbital, another sp3 orbital, and then we have another carbon atom here, which is an head to head overlap of the sp2 uh, orbital another sp2 orbital here, and another sp2 orbital here. In each one of these overlap uh, orbitals here, we have two electrons, right? And then we have the hydrogen atom coming in with the s orbital overlapping with the sp2 hybrid orbital. Hydrogen here, and hydrogen here, and hydrogen here. Now, what is missing at this point in this orbital picture? What is missing? The p orbitals. Very good. Very good. Excellent. The p orbitals. So now, you also have electrons here, two electrons here, two electrons here. So now we have the p orbital on this carbon here and on this carbon here. And another p orbital on this carbon here. So these are the p orbitals. Each one of the p orbitals has an electron. And now we now have to then have the pi bond we have this p orbital overlapping on the side. That's what we mean by side to side overlap. Whereas the sigma uh, the sigma bond, which is this here, are a result of face to face or face I mean head to head overlap or face to face overlap. Now this is what I will call the Orbital picture of ethylene. Okay. <clears throat> now, for the purpose of uh, what I want to do, let let us make things a little easier. For the sigma bond, let us go ahead and just draw the sigma bonds. draw the sigma bonds. And now, we now want to place the p orbital. Okay. The p orbital is one electron each. And when you get the overlap, Okay, let me do this, take this out. Okay. So when you get the overlap, the, those two electrons are now between the two nuclei, under the control of the two nuclei. So we say, let us imagine that those two electrons are so somewhere right here. Okay. <coughs> now, supposing at this point, supposing at this point, 
I move these two electrons, okay, I, I move these two electrons, instead of being under the control of the two nuclei, supposing I move those two electrons, I just move it right here. Keep in mind that each one of those orbitals will take a maximum of two electrons. Now, what do I get? I get this molecule here. Okay, now those two electrons are now here. Okay. Now, what do you think will happen to this molecule? Will there be a formal charge on this carbon? Will there be a formal charge on this carbon? And what, if there is, what would that be? And what would be the formal charge if there is going to be a formal charge? What is it? Negative, Negative one. Very good. So this would be a formal charge of negative one, minus one, right? Would there be a formal charge on this carbon? Yes. And what is it? Plus one. Now, see what we've done here. Instead of giving you the orbital picture, unless I ask you to do that in an exam, ordinarily what I would do is this. I, do the, I draw the ethylene molecule. I gave you the orbital picture so you have a visual view of what is actually happening. Okay, supposing I just draw this ethylene molecule and then I take my arrow, I say I move this to let this by letter, I move it to here. That is the same thing I've done right here. The difference here I simply just showing the how the, or the orbitals to tell you that these electrons are actually going to some kind of orbitals. Now, if I do that, I get this molecule here. By the way, in organic chemistry, anytime you see us draw an arrow like this, what well, that is telling you that we are moving two electrons. Okay? Anytime you see us draw an arrow like this, that tells you we are moving two electrons. Okay, in other words, we are moving these two electrons, going to move these two electrons to the p orbital uh, that is on this carbon atom, just as I did right here. So what do I now have? I have this. Now, and I have a positive charge on this, a formal charge of plus one. And since I move these two here, two electrons here, a formal charge of minus one. These two structures here, we call these two structures resonance structures. We call them resonance structures. Those two structures, they do represent the molecule that we call ethylene. The difference between them is the placement of the pi electron. Those two structures represent what we, the molecule we call ethylene. In other words, we would therefore say ethylene is an hybrid Let us call this molecule A. And let us call this molecule B. So we therefore say ethylene is an hybrid of molecules A and B. Ethylene is a resonance.
hybrid of molecules A and B. Now, and what we have here, this symbol here, this double headed arrow is the symbol for resonance. Now, keep in mind, nobody is saying that molecule A and B are in equilibrium with each other. No, we are not saying that. No, but, no, at no time I will telling you that ethylene sometimes behaves, I mean, uh, sometimes it is like this molecule here, or sometimes it is like this molecule here. No, we are not saying that. It is not an equilibrium. No, that is an equilibrium. That is not the case. Well, what we are saying here, that the true representation of ethylene is these two molecules here. Sometimes ethylene could react as if it is this molecule, sometimes it could react as if it is this molecule. And therefore we say these two structures are resonance are forms of ethylene. And the difference between them is the placement of the pi electron. Okay. Now, if you also take a look at these two molecules, you will find that even though they are resonance uh, forms of the same molecule, of the same compound, they are resonance structures of the same compound, they do not have the same energy. Sometimes resonance structures may not have the same energy. So if I ask you here, between molecule A and B, which one will be the most stable? Between molecules A and B, which will be the most stable? A and Y. That is correct. A is correct. Yes, because that's the most stable one. Because? That's the most stable one. Formal charges are more at zero than the other one. Okay. Which is more stable because if you look at if the carbon atoms here, they obey the octet rule. Look at the carbon atom here. This carbon here, it does obey the octet rule. This carbon obey the octet rule. But if you look at this molecule here, Okay, if you look at here, this molecule, this here does not obey the octet rule. So therefore, this molecule A, B is not as stable as molecule A. So the point to be made here is, sometimes resonance structures may not have the same energy. Okay, what, when we say molecule is, is unstable, means that it has too much energy. In other words, this molecule here, molecule A, will have too much energy compared to molecule A. B will, in, therefore, A will be more stable than B. Okay, so now let us now go back to the definition of resonance that I promised you earlier. Okay, let's see here. Okay, I can, yeah, go ahead. Can you read this for us? Okay. What is resonance? If I ask, what is resonance? Different structural representations of a molecule that only differ by the different placement of the pi or non-binding electron. Very good, and thank you. In other words, if I ask you what is resonance, resonance simply means the different structural representations of the same molecule in which the difference between them, between this, uh, the different structural representation is the placement of the pi electron or non-bonding electron. Let us take a look at this molecule here, for example. This molecule we call the acetate molecule. In this molecule, <coughs> just as we have here, We have this, ox this carbon-oxygen bond, seem to have a carbon-oxygen double bond, right? And this oxygen here, which we have in green, has a formal charge of minus one. On the other hand, if you take a look at this molecule here, let us call this A, let us call this B. Molecule B, on the other hand, you have the carbon-oxygen double bond, on the green oxygen, oxygen is oxygen. Is there any difference between these two molecules? The same molecule. 
But those oxygen still exist. They are still different oxygen atoms. Okay? So we cannot, we cannot represent this, this molecule, which we call acetate ion, by just this structure here, using structure A. So therefore, we've got to use both structure A and structure B to represent this molecule. In this case, this also resonance structures of the same molecule. Both of these are resonance structures of the same molecule. So all we have done here is simply just to move the non-bonding electron. In this case, if you look at what we've done here, if you do this, if you move this here, keep in mind this is in a p orbital. One of these pair of electrons is in a p orbital, just as I showed you earlier. If you move this to here, if you move that to here, because we now know that carbon must only have four bonds, we move this away into a p orbital right here. And that's what we've done here. So now we have a resonance structure, yes. To, to represent this molecule? Right. Yes, that would be the true representation of this molecule. But if you have to do it, you don't have to draw both of them. Unless I tell you to draw the resonance structure of this molecule. Okay? Okay, the way I will ask you that question, I will draw one of them, and I'll say, draw resonance structures of this molecule. Okay. Okay, so therefore, resonance is simply different representation of the same molecule in which the difference between those representations is the placement of pi electron. Notice at no time when you draw resonance, do you involve an sp3 atom? And that is why I show you the orbital picture. Okay, resonance only involves p orbitals. Okay, at no time do you draw resonance that involves an sp3 uh, carbon atom or sp3 atom. Okay, having said that, let's go do a couple of problems. Supposing I give you this here. Supposing I give you that. This molecule. Can you give me, can you give me three other resonance structures of this molecule? This is one of them. Can you give me three other resonance structures of this molecule? To help you out, let me label the atoms. Let us say this atom is one. Of course, by the way, this is non-bond electron here. Let's call the oxygen atom one. Let's call this carbon 2. Let's call this here 3. This carbon 3. Let's call this 4. Now, if we are going to draw resonance structures, just a minute. Well, let's call this 5. Let's call this 6. And let's call this 7. Okay. If you are going to draw your resonance structures, which atom? Atoms in this molecule will be involved in the resonance. Just give me the numbers. One, two, seven. What is the hybridization of the carbon on seven? That seven is sp3 carbon. You cannot involve the sp3 carbon. Okay? Okay, so you say one, two, three, and four. All of those will be involved in resonance because we have p orbitals on those on those atoms. Okay, so let us yes. Now go ahead and ask a question. Okay. Okay. Well, I didn't I didn't get the question, but see me after the class if you have uh, another question. I, I can't hear you. She thought you were asking her a question. Oh, I did? She thought you were. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Okay, so one, two, three, and four. Those are the atoms that will be involved in the resonance here. Okay, so let us draw the first resonance structure. Okay, which pi electron do you want to move? Which pi electron do you want to move? You want to move from uh, the one between the uh, oxygen one and two? Okay, I will move that to oxygen. Okay, if you do that, we have this resonance structure. They have, once you do that, of course, do you have, do you have any formal charges here? Where would be the formal charges and what would they be? Oxygen, minus one, right? Mm -hmm. About carbon? Plus one. Plus one. Okay. So that would be a resonance structure for this molecule. Yes. Any other resonance structure? Yes. When I move the pi electron to oxygen, say that again. Yeah, that is why we now you have to place a formal charge on that carbon because you're moving it, you are, you are moving the electron away from carbon and placing the electron on oxygen. So oxygen has a formal charge of minus one now, and then the carbon will have a formal charge of plus one. Okay. Okay, about what other form uh, resonance can you draw here? Yes. Between? Yes. Go to? Okay, let me help you out. Supposing we move this to here. Keep in mind, at this point, this p orbital here is empty. Mm -hmm. This p orbital here is empty. So these two electrons here could move, and now they will now be under the control of these two carbon atoms. And that was why I was showing you the orbital picture, show you, showing you that we are actually moving through the p orbitals, electrons through the p orbitals. If we do that, what do we have? Uh, we have Doesn't have to always have to do what? Yes, sometimes, yes. Sometimes, if you are dealing, now that is a good question. It simply does mean that it is not as stable as the other resonance structure that has, that obeys the object rule. Okay? Okay, in this case, this would be more stable than this one here, because this does not obey the object rule. Okay, okay so now you have, this is here. Now the double bond will now be here. We still have this here. And we still have this hydrogen here. Now what do you think is going to now happen to this carbon? What happened to this carbon? Plus charge. Very good. It now has a formal charge of plus one. Notice what we have here. We started with a neutral molecule, right? At all the all the time, each resonance structure you have must be electrically neutral. You have positive charge, negative charge. Positive charge, negative charge. The molecule must be electrically neutral. Okay? So all of these are resonance structures of the same molecule. Okay. 
So in resonance, therefore, all you are doing is simply moving our electrons around. And so we are going to be doing a lot of resonance. This is not the end of resonance. <laughs> Indeed, a lot of the things that we do in organic chemistry, we use resonance to explain them. Okay, so this is the beginning, uh, this is just an introduction to resonance. So you will hear me talk about resonance. Why is this reaction taking place? Why is this taking place? Because of resonance, okay? So resonance, in many instances, who help us to explain a lot of the processes that take place in organic chemistry. So anyway, at this point, I want to uh, ask, go to another concept <coughs> in order to end this chapter. Uh, but you guys need to do a lot of practice on resonance. Go to your book, write as many, uh, do as many practice as you can, write in resonance structures. Keep in mind, all you do when you do resonance, you move only pi electron and sometimes non-bonding electron. That's all you do. You do not, you do not break a, a break a sigma bond in order to write resonance, which is to say that you cannot involve an sp3 atom. Yes. Three and four. Right here. Yeah. You cannot because this is an sp five is an sp three carbon. There is no p orbital on five. Uh, okay. In order for you to involve an atom in resonance, yeah. there must be a p orbital, and that was why I gave you those orbital picture earlier. You follow that? So five, you cannot involve five. You cannot involve six. Okay. Very good. Okay, at this point, let us now go to uh, Okay, I want to shift here a little bit <coughs> and talk about the last uh, topic on this uh, chapter two. which is acid base reaction. So let us discuss acid-base reaction. If you recall, when you did your general chemistry, you had two types of acid-base reaction. In chemistry, we have what we call the Bronsted, Lowry, Acid base reaction. Then you add the second type of acid base reaction called the Lewis acid base reaction. Now, does anybody recall what the Bronsted? Lowry acid base reaction. What would be a Bronsted acid? What what would be a Bronsted acid? Yes. Uh, donor, right? A proton donor. A species that donates a proton or hydrogen. Hydrogen. Okay. So a Bronsted acid is a proton donor. In other words, what do we mean by proton? Proton is the it's hydrogen in which we have lost the valence electron. Okay? We call it the proton. Don't forget, for hydrogen, hydrogen only has one electron. Hydrogen only has one electron in this, uh, the S orbital. If you remove this hydrogen from, um, this electron from, from hydrogen, it becomes what we call a proton. It becomes positively charged, and so we call that a proton. Okay? So therefore, a bronsted acid is a proton donor. 
A bronzed acid is a proton donor. Now, what would be a bronzed base? What is a bronzed base? A proton acceptor, exactly. A, a bronzed base will be, we'll come back to this Lewis acid later. A bronzed base will be a proton acceptor. That is a bronzed base. Okay? So therefore, having given that information, let us take a look at this reaction here. In this reaction, we have acetic acid. This is, by the way, this is your ma the uh, major component of your vinegar. For those of you who uh, eat uh, uh, salad, you know, use vinegar to, to flavor your salad. Okay, this is acetic acid here. And we have hydroxide, okay? The acetic acid here, of course, we say acid already, will be your bronsted acid. Because if you look at what is happening here, this hydroxide is pulling a proton from here to form water. And then once we form the water, we then form this acetate ion, we call this acetate ion, which is this here. So this will be your classic bronsted acid base reaction, in which the acetic acid here is acting as a proton donor, and the hydroxide is acting as a proton acceptor. In this case, we form water, and then the acetate ion. Now, if you also look at this, just to relate this to resonance that we gave you earlier. <coughs> Take a look at this here. Can you see this number? We say PKA value 4.76. Can you see it? Okay. We could actually determine the relative strength, relative strength of different types of organic acid. And the measure of that relative strength is what we call the pKa value. In other words, just like you have the pH, you could determine the pKa for a given organic acid. So we say the pKa for acidic acid is 4.76. In other words, the ability to lose this hydrogen here. And then we come here. We look at water here. We say the pKa for water, which is to say that the, the ability of water to lose a proton is 15.74. Now, the higher the pKa value, higher pKa means less acidic. The higher the pKa, the less acid that molecule is. So if you have the low pKa, that means that molecule is very is, is more acidic than the higher pKa. Okay? So the higher pKa means less acidic. Okay, on the other hand, low pKa means more acidic. So we do have a table of uh, pKa values for different organic acids. Whenever you have to take an exam, we will give you those table of pKa values because they come in very handy when we get to working problems. For example, can you see this table here? Okay, here we have 
ethanol, which is the ethyl alcohol, the drinking alcohol, you say as a pKa of 16, water pKa of 15.74, okay, hydrochloric acid minus 7, which is to say that this is a lot more acidic than, than water, and this is your acetic acid here, pKa of 4.76. Now the question is, if you take a look at this, we have acetic acid. This is the structure of acetic acid. And then we have water. Acetic acid has a pKa of 4.76 and water pKa of 15.74. The question is, why is acidic acid more acidic than water? Okay, I'll tell you now. <coughs> the strength of an acid, let me write it down for you here. The strength of an acid of an acid depends depends on the stability of on the stability stability of the conjugate base in this particular instance Whenever the acidic acid, say we have acidic acid, loses a proton, let us assume that it loses this proton. We call this, after it has lost the proton, the product you get, we call it the conjugate base. So similarly, so the conjugate base for acetic acid is the acetate anion. The acetate ion is the conjugate base of acetic acid. Then if you take a look at water, the conjugate base of water, let us assume water loses a proton. The conjugate base of water is hydroxide anion. So we say the strength of an acid depends on the stability of the conjugate base. Okay, so let us take a look at these two acids here, acidic acid and water. Why is acidic acid more acidic than water? In other words, why does it want to lose a proton much more readily than water? I would say the answer is resonance. Okay? The answer is resonance. Because the conjugate base of this acetate here is stabilized by resonance. Okay, we could draw resonance structures that will have to delocalize de this electron along these three atom chain right here. As a result of resonance, the conjugate base of acetic acid is much more stable than the conjugate base of water because in, in the hydroxide anion there is no room for resonance. Okay? So you begin to see the role of resonance here. Let me go to the next one. We do a resonance structure for this. In which we simply move this to here, pi electron to here. We move this pi electron away. Of course, this is already here. You 
Okay? So these two resonance structures here, they stabilize the acetate anion. Hence, it is more stable than stable than the hydroxyl ion. And that is why the acetic acid is more acidic than water. Because the, keep in mind, the strength of an acid depends on the stability of the conjugate base. Got five more minutes. <laughs> you too. Okay, two more minutes. Is that right? Okay. Uh, okay. Anyway, so at this point, we now begin to see how we use resonance to explain some of what we see in organic chemistry. And uh, so when we come back, <coughs> guess what? On Thursday. There will be a short quiz on today's lecture. And then we will finish on chapter 2 and then start chapter 3. We only have a little bit more for to go on chapter 2, but uh, there will be a very short quiz on today's lecture, just on today's lecture on Thursday. So tell all of your friends to come prepared for that. So at this point, we have finished today's lecture, and uh, I will see you around on. Uh, some of you may want to see me before we meet on Thursday. If you want to uh, download your uh, those uh, webcasts into your flash drive, okay? Thank you.